Thank you for having me back. Um, I love this uh, idea of continuous information collection and continuous adapting. So you saw the last slide, which was three, uh, 62 patients who you know, had this event-free survival spectacular. MD Anderson is amazing to me. And um, on our Friday meeting, for example, at 5 p.m. JEDA time, frequently we have MD Anderson speakers because they're so innovative and so creative. What I want to talk about now is how you can have an information system so that you can early detect problems. And actually, one of our MD Anderson colleagues presented two weeks ago, and he said, basically, when we first implemented chemo-free, we had too many CNS relapses. We were doing eight ITs. And so they recognize this. How do they recognize this? Because they were publishing the paper. So as they're writing for JCO, they say, oh, too many CNS relapse. So then they say, we're going to modify. Then the next one, doing the journal, OK, we're going to modify. So you saw 12 to 15 there. And so you think, yeah, we've got to prevent the CNS relapse. So chemo-free, if you use Blina I know, it doesn't get to the CNS. So what are you going to do? You better put something in the CNS, otherwise you have CNS relapse. You might have spectacular bone marrow control, but with CNS relapse. And I wonder if you guys noticed on the last slide, three out of 62 had a CNS relapse. So it looks like 12 to 15 may not be enough to prevent CNS relapse, and maybe it needs to be 18, or maybe they need to give you know a little micro CVAD or something to make sure to get that to zero. Because three out of 62, you think, oh, it's only three patients. But remember, the whole thing is only 62 patients. So that's 5%. And you can say, well, 5%, it's not statistically said, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, three is too many, right? It should be zero out of 62, or maybe half of one out of 62, ideally. So um, I'm going to talk about the, these four things, the importance of integration, and three examples. So first of all, the importance, uh, this is obvious, right? Life is short. You don't want to be typing the same information five places. You don't want to be clicking into five computers, one to see your x-rays, one to see your lab, one to see the note, one to see you know the WhatsApp message. And our human attention span is also very short. So if I have to spend 30 minutes just collecting the information, maybe I'm going to cut some corners. And have you ever had it where the resident is presenting the patient and they say all this crazy stuff, and then you realize they didn't have time to actually check everything. And so they just started you know, doing it too fast. The third thing, resources are limited. Even when resources are abundant, they're not infinite. And human resources are always limited, right? By Also, it's just cruel to make a human type one thing from one place to another. And automation reduces errors. So here's an example. Let's suppose you were doing a clinical trial. You had to collect all the purple data. And you're doing a cancer registry, where you have to collect all the orange data. And you're doing a an antimicrobial resistance project with your infectious disease colleagues, the green one. So now you have a purple project, a green, an orange project, and a green project. And the types of data, though, are the same for all three projects. There's the demographics, and there's you know, some diagnosis information, and toxicities, and outcomes, and so on. And you shouldn't have to type the demographics three times. You should type it one time. So on the far right there is an integrated information system. You do all three projects. And if the first person shows up is the clinical trial person, they put in all the purple. You're done. The next one could just put in a little bit of orange about the microbiology data. And maybe the last one, or sorry, the green one. And the cancer registry person might put the laterality or something that is important for registries, but that we don't really care if it's right or left you know, for a lot of clinical reasons. So between the three groups, for me, it's really sad when you visit a hospital, like every single hospital on the planet, and then you say, oh, that's our cancer registry. These three people here are typing the registry. Uh, that's our clinical trials office. These five people here are typing the clinical trials. Oh, that's the resident doing a special project, typing in all the infectious data. All of these people are duplicating their work, and it's a shame. So what about Safos ALL Genomics? This is a terrific project that um, started in 2021, and of course it was overlapping with the pandemic, but this still I admire you guys for getting it done. And here's the integrated information system. And what does it integrate? In this case, it integrates genomes that were collected as part of the project on Saudi children with ALL and clinical data. And which clinical data? The blood counts all through the first year of maintenance therapy. And why the blood counts? Because um, you want the blood counts to know if a, there's a genomic predictor of bad tolerance of mercaptopurine maintenance or methotrexate maintenance. So now imagine you have 50 blood counts once a week for 50 weeks, and you've got to type that into some computer. Then you've got to do some math to see if it was too low or too high. 
you need an integrated information system, right? Because that's cruel to make people do that. Now, they did it, and they got it done, and the results are really going to be interesting. But you want something that will integrate the genomics and the lab data and the clinical data, how often they got admitted for febrile neutropenia, how many got septic. Did anyone die of, of uh, sepsis? If there's even one death, that's one too many. So integrated information system could save a lot of typing. And what I love about certain information systems, like the one offered by Resonance for free, is you see how it automatically de-identifies the data here. You see this name, Roba Azab. That's the data entry person. That's not the patient. So it doesn't anonymize the personnel. You want to know who did the data, the entry. But it anonymizes the patient. So you can have eight centers in Saudi Arabia, and the study coordinator doesn't need to see personal information. They have a study number, so they could always do their audit based on the study number. So this idea, because sometimes people say, I don't want to use an information system. I have Excel, and I love Excel. I also love Excel. It's so useful. It's so great. And half the time, uh, which is why I insisted that this thing would export to Excel, just uh, click that button, and now you have Excel. But when it exports to Excel, of course, it anonymizes the data on the way out. And why does it do that? Because imagine you have Excel, you have 500 patients, and you have all their names and their birthday and where they live, and then somebody, you lose your laptop on the metro. And I know you don't you lose your laptop on the metro, and I try not to lose mine, but when I was medical information officer at St. Jude, somebody did lose their laptop on the metro. And then they confessed, oh, I had 2,000 patients in an Excel sheet. And as a medical information officer, you have to lead this thing called the privacy investigation. And the privacy investigation, you also have to notify all 2,000 patients. And, you know, it's hard to find 2,000 patients. And if you don't notify 97% or more, you have to publish in the major newspapers of the 50 largest cities where your patients are treated that we've had a violation of privacy and we're happy to buy you special privacy protections and all this data protection uh, as, a, as a service to the people whose privacy we violated. So imagine you're St. Jude. You raise $1 billion a year in philanthropy from very kind people who want to support your hospital. And now the top 50 newspapers say how we don't respect the privacy of the patients that you paid for with your philanthropy. So it's bad. Anyway, I had to call Puerto Rico and talk to the neighbor of the last patient to get to 97%. So that's why it was fresh in my mind, even though it's been 15 years now. So no laptop should have private data. One way to prevent that is you don't let people download by, by policy, but also by software. Because policy will only get you so far. There's always somebody who has a, a temporary lapse in judgment. And when it's a resident, I sympathize because they're sleep deprived and sleep is part of judgment is having good sleep. So it's understandable there would be mistakes. So we have to prevent the mistakes through systems and through policy. So here we see on the bottom the mercaptopurine, the methotrexate, every dose, the prescribed dose and the dose taken and the CBC that goes with it, the blood count that goes with it. So what are the next steps? The next steps are to actually analyze the data and then decide should every patient get genomic data to predict their problems with maintenance therapy. And I ask you, should every patient have a whole genome sequence to predict toxicities of their therapy? Too expensive, Too expensive. right. Well, I'm gonna first, let's do multiple choice. Yes or no, and then we'll do reasons. So who says yes, do it on everybody? Who says no, don't do it on everybody? Who says do it on some people? Okay, if you can't get everybody, I like you raising your hand twice. If you can't do all, do some. And you say no because too expensive? I agree. Um, however, the price is, well, no, I don't agree. I don't know. How are you going to know? That's why you guys did the study. So hats off to Sapphos for doing the work. We'll know maybe by next year we'll know what to do and if it's useful. Uh, but the one thing we can't do, though, is make it standard practice and have it sit in a database. Because if it's going to be standard practice, it better affect the patient's care day by day, right? It better be telling us information that we use to save that person's life. So then we'll be enthusiastic about spending the money if we have to, but not before. So they'll tell us whether we should be doing it in every patient. But if we do it, we need to act on the results, which means we need an integrated information system. And finally, um, yeah, so if you said yes, it has to be integrated. 
So antimicrobial resistance, and this is, uh, it's always fun when other people get into your own area. So the infectious disease people teamed up with the oncology people and had this summit uh, where they were talking about antimicrobial resistance as it affects cancer patients, because it affects everybody, but it especially affects our patients. And so this was a chance to highlight a way to integrate the information system. So now imagine you're the microbiology person and your job is every year you're supposed to make your antimicrobiogram. And what is the antimicrobiogram? This says every time we grow E. coli out of somebody's blood, what's the chance it's sensitive to cefepime or ceftriaxone or ceftra or whatever else? And so somebody has to go all through the culture files and all through the bacteria and find those bacteria and find what they were sensitive to and put it into a system. But really, we've already put it into a system called the chart. And the patient's chart has the, the organism. And it has where the organism came from, blood, urine, spinal fluid. And it has the sensitivities. So you're trying to produce this, and you already have the data sitting in the medical record. So I've been doing a non-scientific survey of the poor people who have to make the antimicrobiogram. And my first question is, how often do you have to update it? And the answer is always the same, every two years. So every hospital follows this, this is a global guideline. Every two years you're supposed to update this because it changes. And then the next question is, how often do you actually update it? Guess what? <laughs> and then usually they say, oh yeah, we follow every two years. And I say, oh, when's the last update? Let's find the one you use now. Inevitably, the date on that thing, if you take today's date and minus that date, it's always more than two years. Sometimes it's 10 years since it's been updated. Why? It's a lot of work, a lot of work. And so what happens if instead you have an integrated information system where the cultures are sitting right there, but they feed automatically, and it turns out the R statistical language has built in already a package. We didn't even make this package. We downloaded R. R is free. Our software is free. It's all open source. So you just put R into our software, and if you type your culture results, which you're typing in there anyway for your patient, or if you integrate with your medical record, the culture results automatically generate the antimicrobiogram. Even more important, it enables innovation. What kind of innovation? Have you ever looked at your antimicrobiogram and then you say, but wait a minute, this is an AML patient. They've been pancytopenic for eight weeks. They're on prophylactic levofloxacin and vori. Do you think the resistance of their bacteria will be the same as a five-year-old who just got diagnosed with a Wilms tumor? Totally different. That patient's never been admitted, never is gonna be admitted, except for one short surgery. So you want to know your antimicrobiogram. Wouldn't it be nice to say, only show me if it's an ICU patient? Well, that's the beauty of an information system. You say, do it just for ICU. All those colors, they'll change because they get a lot more red, unfortunately. There's a lot more resistance in the ICU. Or only show me AML. Or only show me patients who have been admitted in the last 90 days. So you can have a patient-specific antimicrobiogram. Talk about precision medicine. You can even have precision microbiology. Right? based on that patient's characteristics. And it's like click of a button. So information systems with automation is the beautiful thing on the right-hand side. I have personally applied this to high-dose methotrexate. <clears throat> so I get to do the last two points, right? First lumbar puncture, never on day one. Lie flat for at least an hour. Number three, if you have refractory CNS, oh, sorry, number three is bicarb. Number four, I know we're gonna prevent all the CNS relapse. But if we don't, and if the patient's multiply relapsed in the CNS, and if you're about to go explain what is hospice and palliative care, that's the patient who needs 33 grams of high-dose methotrexate right now today. And this was done in the 80s before we had glucarpidase. Now we have glucarpidase. That we had no back door, nothing, just fluids, bicarb, leucovorin. Now we have that plus glucarpidase, which is quite magical at getting rid of methotrexate. So I'm not saying to do this front line, definitely not saying that, but I am saying you can't palliate CNS, progressive CNS leukemia or lymphoma. These patients die in horrible pain. And you've all, if anybody who's treated even one, you remember it like it was yesterday because they're usually screaming and screaming and screaming and you give morphine and they scream and you give everything and they scream and you finally give propofol drip and they go unconscious. But even unconscious, sometimes you see their face twitching, you know, groaning, even unconscious. So for me, I would rather die of anything than that. And what if instead you could not die and have a CR 
after one cycle. So that's the fourth point, which is if your current strategy is terrible, that's the time to pull out an old strategy from the 80s that worked great in the 80s, should work today. And we're going to do it even safer, though, because now we have tools, in integrated tools like mtxpq.org, which we integrated into our technology platform, which is called the Residence Patient Center. So the same thing that's doing genomes and maintenance therapy and the antimicrobiogram is also doing your high-dose methotrexate Calculating this curve, not based on any patient, based on your patient. Your 72-year-old with a creatinine of 1.1, who's male, who got 5 grams over 4 hours. That's what that curve is. If it's a 20-year-old with a creatinine of 0.8, who got 4 grams over 10 hours, it'll be a different curve. But it doesn't matter because you just type in the information and you get what you need. If you see blue, that's a glucarbonase and fluids candidate. And the other thing is we built in here recommendations. So these are recommendations based on the global standard. But nobody likes the global standard, right? You need a hospital policy for your hospital. And many countries don't have glucarpidase. So Iraq, for example, no glucarpidase. So do you want to recommend glucarpidase to people who can't use it? I think it's mean and stupid. You want to recommend the best thing, alternative to glucarpidase. Remember back in the 80s, we had no glucarpidase. We cured a lot of people and saved a lot of kidneys with IV fluids, leucovorin, and bicarb. So the recommendation here, if you make your own hospital recommendation, it overrides the global one. So nobody's going to force you to see a recommendation that you didn't already approve. If you just do nothing, you'll see this, because this is what our, the Monday team, the Methotrexate Research and Care Network, developed. So the fifth thing to remember is early clearance. And this early clearance here, you see that uh, blue curve dropping like it should versus the red curve almost um, horizontal. We found in our animal model that every single animal who had this bad curve at the first four hours, so this you do the infusion, then you measure the level of methotrexate at the end of the infusion, and four hours later. This is pure renal elimination during that very early phase. And the half-life of methotrexate is 1.3 hours. So three half-lives is four hours. So in four hours, it should be half, 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 one-eighth, about 10% of the level after four hours. So if it drops like the blue, that's a 90% drop. That's what it's supposed to do. That means you have normal renal function. This is like a GFR measurement, essentially. It's a perfect surrogate for GFR in that very early period. When the curve is flattening out, that's some biliary excretion, some third compartments, complicated PK. That's not pure GFR, but the early part is pure GFR. So if you see that red line, what that means is you already have acute kidney injury. The creatinine hasn't gone up yet, so you can't diagnose the acute kidney injury, but the nephrons have been damaged. There's methotrexate crystals in the, in the urine, in the nephrons, and the nephrons have been damaged. And you know, because otherwise, the methotrexate would be clearing like it's supposed to. Instead, it's not clearing. So you've diagnosed acute kidney injury now before the creatinine's changed at all. And so we named this thing the early clearance biomarker, because every other biomarker to predict methotrexate delayed elimination failed. That didn't fail. You can predict, you say, oh, it's more likely if you're on omeprazole. It's more likely if you're on a TKI. It's more likely if you're old. It's more likely if you got a higher dose. Sure, all of those are more likely, but none of those give you a yes or a no. They give you like a shades of gray. This one's a little more gray, a little less gray. But the really less gray could still have acute kidney injury. So this actually early biomarker is nearly perfect. And um, the receiver operator curve looks like that. So people who like receiver operator curves, you would be happy, but I don't like them. So we use this PK model to, to, for each patient, one by one, just like the patient-specific antimicrobiogram, just like the patient-specific genomic predictor of maintenance therapy. And it tells you if this early thing is delayed, but you have to measure those two early levels. So the fifth thing I want you to do starting today is after the infusion, measure a level at the end, and measure a level four hours later, you feed it in, you calculate the slope. If that slope is not good, then increase the fluids always and make sure about the bicarb and the urine pH. Consider glucarpidase. Not all of these should get glucarpidase. You can measure another level 12 hours later and then decide because you don't give glucarpidase that early. Oh, yeah, there is the ROC curve. So um, also, it's fun to treat the patient really well. It's twice as fun to join our research protocol, our global high-dose methotrexate quality improvement program, and 
these two extra levels are, I consider them a study test if you're doing it on a study. I consider it a clinical test if you're not part of the study. You can still act on it to save your patient's kidney, but I would rather you be part of the study because then also all of us together, many brains are much better than just one brain. So we can all help each patient. So those four extra, three of those are study, study levels. Uh, this is an unfunded study, so bring love because all you're gonna get back is love, not money. There's the early clearance biomarker. So this is some preliminary data from two centers in Spain. Uh, we need more data and we need better data. So there's a subtitle. Look at that, on time and on budget. And I want to finish with this one last thing. Integrated information systems are great, but in integrated human systems are more important. Right? If we're here together, not to see some slideshow, we can see this on YouTube and should see it on YouTube. If we're here together to make sure we know each other and can join protocols together, do projects together, treat patients together, come online together on Mondays and Fridays at 5 p.m. and really up our game every single day, every single week, not once a year, not once every six months, but integrated human systems are phenomenal. So I was so happy to come back here and I expected to see these three guys and um, this restaurant, uh, it's the best samak I've ever had in my life. Like, unbelievable. Fresh, jumping from the river right into the restaurant. And I expected to see this guy, but I got some good surprises, and I got to meet um, his family, which I've never met before, even though we've known each other for 15, 20 years. And um, also got to meet this guy from uh, Iraq, who we were on the same flight together. And we didn't meet on the flight, we met in the car. So I think whenever you're at a meeting, the bus rides to the dinner and the car rides, probably the best time ever, right? Because at the table, you're not meeting each other, you're just you know, doing your laptop and, and, and listening. But in the bus, hey, perfect. So human systems, I invite you to join the human systems that are focused on certain issues. But part of that is just the human system because half the time we're in here, somebody talks about asparaginase or about septic shock or about their patient with second relapse who's, uh, you know, should they get more blood atumumab or not. So being together has so many advantages. Human systems. And if you miss the human system though, you can just download it, no problem, and watch it in the car. So please join us and thank you so much for this invitation and this time.